In. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, webinar. I'm Alex Chisholm from the Festival of Enterprise, as always, hosting today. Uh, we're talking about how to make success business as usual. Um, eight things you should be doing regardless of a global crisis. Uh, brought to you by Practical CFO. I'm joined by Matt Topham, uh, Director, Practical CFO, and Angela Marie Graham, Client CFO, Practical CFO. Good afternoon to you both. <laughs> Good afternoon, afternoon, Alex. Um, to both of you coming, broadcasting live from South London at the moment. Yep. Or well, just to reach out to, 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 to Suki, because I'm from Cardiff. So actually, we're nowhere so am I. Yeah. I'm from Cardiff <laughs> as well. Yeah. How scary is that? It's Tuffier. Here you go. We'll have that conversation later on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we've got people get lost in uh, where we're from otherwise i think uh, so indeed right well cardiff in full effect anyone else with you Saki? so uh do post up i'm broadcasting from paul in dorset so anybody else um let us know where you are watching in from today ben good afternoon to you as well um so if you're watching live here on the Festival of Enterprise. Uh, welcome, you can post up any questions, any commentary. Um, we've got a poll running as well, just so we can tailor the content to who's watching. People are voting already. 50-50 uh, at the moment between do you own your own business, yes or no? Um, and the third option is you're thinking of starting one. So um, if you click the poll button, you can register your vote. So just let us know if you are a business owner, if you're not, or whether you're thinking of joining the ranks of uh, business owners. Um, and we'll pin Cushion joining us. Clearly got to be a business there. Uh, thank you for joining us um, from Walkworth. And if you are watching this on social media, we are streaming live on Facebook, Twitter, um, and YouTube as well. Then if you'd like to come and join us here and be a little bit more interactive, then please do so. Just go to festivalofenterprise.co.uk to register for this webinar. Um, if, however, you are down on the beach here in pool and you're watching on your phone, that's fine as well. I will monitor social media as well. Um, thank you. You'll also all get uh, an email afterwards um, with some links uh, from Matt and Angela Marie as well. Um, before we dive in, just to kind of frame this for you all watching today. Clearly, you've, you've read this because you've registered for this, uh, but Practical CFO helps ambitious organizations create robust business plans, implement effective systems, and build strong financial foundations. Uh, this webinar is going to offer practical takeaways on the key things you should always be doing to help make your business succeed and grow. And this includes things such as how to understand and work your commercial model, why you should review your product market fit, and how a solid finance strategy equals success all round. So we're going to be answer, asking questions, um, having a Q&A at the end. But please post up any questions as we go through the webinar. And I'll curate those um, and reposition those as we as we get towards the, the end of the webinar today. So, um, hey, Neil from Nottingham, thank you for joining us as well. Um, anybody else, let us know. Um, feel free, like I've done, post up your LinkedIn profile to connect. Um, I think, look, we're meant to be doing these kind of things at live events, weren't we, not that long ago? Um, and I'm sure we will when we are fully opened in this country with regards to you know hospitality, events, et cetera, we could do so. So in the meantime, I do encourage you all to, to connect, post up your LinkedIn profiles maybe here. Um, any commentary you got on um, this webinar, from uh, Matt and Angela Marie, uh, let us know. And likewise, questions as we go through that you might be asking um, what you should be doing to make your, your business successful as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over the reins to, to Matt um, and Angela Marie. And thank you. Well done. Neil's on the ball straight in there. Well done. Thanks, Neil. Uh, <laughs> over to you guys. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks, Alex. Much appreciated. So um, we come at this with a, um, a, a view of the world that a, a well-planned business 
not only give some objectives, some sort of um, context to what we're trying to achieve, but the planning process is actually incredibly insightful. It gives a view of what's important, but just as importantly, what's not important, um, and and allows a bit of um, a, a bit of pre-planning, um, which means that we can improve a model, we can improve our economics, we can make some choices about profit versus cash, for example. So um, what we see is that um, is that businesses who have a, have a plan, or whether that's a written plan or a financial plan have greater consistency, because actually they're focusing on making the right things happen at all the, at, at each right stage. Because they know what's important, actually the business has greater confidence, it can, uh, it can react, it can take opportunities, it can go and do something this afternoon, as opposed to have to think about it to work out whether it's a great idea or not. It can be a bit more instinctive. And actually, that's a bit more enjoyable than nothing else. Um, and then because if a business is, is commercially more successful, then um, actually it tends to have greater profits and therefore probably cash. And then if you're the sort of person who wants to, wants to try and sell your best business at the end of the process, um, actually they tend to have better valuations as well because they are more successful, they are more focused, they are clearer about the message, they're clearer about what it is they're doing for their customers. But this, this can so often feel like a bit of a theoretical exercise. And so what I wanted to do was start with a real company. This is um, a, a client from about three years ago. And, um, and this client is, um, is a media agency, and they um, they sort of they sort of got lost a little bit. They had grown, so I've got I've got some numbers on the on the slide there. Um, the uh, the top number is the money coming in, and it's used to spend a significant amount of money coming in on the orange line, which is the salaries, and then it used to pay some um, pay some overheads on the green line, which means the bottom line, which was the profit was never very healthy. It was always all over the place and frequently was a loss. And so the business was always being reactive, looking behind it, trying to work out where the next cash, bit of cash was coming from, trying to cover the wages at the end of the month, all those sorts of issues. And so we sat down and I looked at the, some of those numbers and some of the, some of the, um, some of the underlying trends in that, in that number. Um, but also, there's a, there's a couple of little KPIs that, that, that flip up here. So from every £100 that they used to get in at the top end, they used to spend £66 on payroll, £27 on overheads, which meant they had £7 left over for themselves. It was a quick benchmarking exercise, quickly recognised that their competitors were managing that. So for every £100 they got in, the competitors were spending £50 on salary, £23 on, on GMA, which means they were four times more profitable. Now, when I met this business originally, they used to say, oh my goodness, the expenses claims are ridiculous and isn't it terrible? But actually, those KPIs immediately say the expenses claims are ordinary. Their big challenge seems to be the amount they're spending on people. I'm not saying this is the same issue for everybody, but this analysis proved it was the issue for them. And then the conversation widens out a little bit into, well, what is it you're trying to achieve? And for those guys, they wanted to uh, they wanted to get a 10 million pounds valuation because that's what they wanted to sell the company for. An arbitrary objective, but that's what they decided. It's very, very useful to do that, that, that analysis, that numbers analysis, because what, what I could come to is saying, well, look, if I looked at the graph, they had routinely, historically turned over about a million and a half, two million pounds a year. But to get to their 10 million, 10 million pounds valuation, they probably needed to grow from 2 to 12, which is going some for anybody. But if we could employ some benchmarks and if we could employ some focus and get some of the, some of the other commercial issues about the business right, actually, you'd probably get to their 10 million pounds valuation at 4 million pounds of revenue. So they only had to double in size. Now, double in size is a big deal, but it's a lot easier than growing 12 times. So, Immediately, by trying to set out what was achievable, what was important, was, was key to setting out the initial plan. And our initial conclusions then came to, and this wasn't us sitting in isolation trying to work out what to do for this business, it was working with them to try what was, what was important. There were only three things that were important in this business. One, revenue, getting it and doing it. Those two things are really important. So, um, make making sure the pipeline was always full, getting lots of new projects in, making sure the projects were big enough, suitable enough in order to deliver, and when a project came in, doing it. 
And then productivity, not over-servicing clients, making sure that the scope was stuck to, for example. So keeping our costs in relation to, uh, to our revenues. And the last bit may seem a bit obvious, but of course, they were an agency, so they were, they were, they were employing people to do things. You pay people at the end of every month. If you don't get the, the, the client dynamics right, and you don't get paid on time, actually you run into trouble very, very quickly. So their third KPI, getting paid on time. And this didn't need some complicated dashboard of, um, of 48 KPIs. This needed three things to look after this business. But of course, stuff is not quite as simple as that because they needed a little bit of extra information in order to um, in order to see some of the some of the, see through some of those KPIs. So actually, if you looked at the original graph, revenue was very very lumpy line because they weren't very good at um, at recording revenue. They tend to send invoices to people rather than think about what they'd achieved. So we had to get that right because that's a key driver in the KPI. And then um, we also had to bring in some time reporting analysis because actually that was about managing the cost of the business and managing the people and what they did for their clients. So that was what happened a couple of years ago. And um, if you remember their objectives was, was something like by 2020 to try and turn about 4 million quid. Well, this is where they are today. And it's not because we're brilliant, it's just we may help them focus on the right sort of stuff. So their revenues have picked up from two to five and a half, which is bonkers growth. That's, about, that's brilliant. Their profit about 20 odd percent. Now actually the benchmark was 28, and they have chosen just not to be as profitable as they as they could be, because actually that's the culture of their business, and that's great too. They've got a significant amount of cash in the bank. Um, we have had been approached a couple of times to sell the business and decided not to, because actually we feel confident, confident and comfortable with the business. So actually, they want to grow even faster, and they've raised they some extra money in order to try and do that. And all of that is from deciding what was important, having a bit of focus, having some consistency, making sure there were some back office processes, which means that we could worry about the stuff that was really important to clients and delighting clients. Because essentially, that is where, where growth comes from, delighting clients. So if that if that's sort of my uh, my argument as to why you should um, you should you should look at the presentation and you should look at the eight things and you should do the eight things, um, well there are the eight things. That's what we want to start with. Issue one: we actually want to define what's important, and there are all sorts of different successes. And, and Angela Marie will have a look at that through us, uh, for us. Looking at the model, but more importantly, looking about what we can do with the model becomes the next piece. Next piece. And that's probably not an everyday exercise, but it's a, it's a critical exercise, and revisiting that frequently is useful. Product market fit, very, very easy to assume that what you're doing is what somebody wants to buy, and testing that assumption is really important. Then I want to have a look at, um, at sales and think about process, and why sales isn't some vast, uh, mystical exercise, it is a process. And then also bringing insight um, from finance, not just in finance, but insight from finance into the broader business. And of course, if we can become a data-led and a decision-led organization, uh, why data might be important, and data drives us to, to KPIs, and hey, if we're going to have a, um, a business session, then we have to talk about cash. So, um, and to read, if you're happy, on to what success Okay, thanks, like. Matt. Okay, thank you, Matt. So I think the most important thing to say about success is that it's not a one-size-fits-all criteria. It's going to be different for different people in different places. So for some people, it's about their profits. For others, it's about their revenue, their market penetration, or the awareness of their brand. But the main thing I'd like you to take away from this is that success is specific to you. It may, can, it may include non-financial measures. Um, so for example, in the, in the example that Matt mentioned earlier, staff retention was very important to them and they, they kept their staff retention by not having as big as a profit as they could do compared to everybody else. For you, it may be customer satisfaction or it may be getting some sort of level of involvement from your various stakeholders. Whatever your success is, or however you define your success, it's got to be in the context of where you are now. So yes, your competition, your place in the market, where we are now with COVID, because as you know, to, to state the obvious, success before COVID and after COVID, or even coming out of COVID is not necessarily going to be the same as success within COVID. So you might need to uh, refine your success criteria as we, you go through this journey. But no matter what you do, however you define it, it's got to be in manageable chunks. 
And I'm not sure if you can see this on the slide anymore because I think our pictures are down the bottom there, but one way to look at or to break down your what is success is into an acronym that we call SMART. So the first thing about your success is that it should be specific and to the point. The next thing about it is it should be measurable. It should be objective, something that you're able to record and go back to and see how well you've done. It should be achievable. You know, if you want to be the leading player in your sector, there's no point maybe setting that up as your criteria when you first start or a success criteria, but you may build your success criteria to get there by saying, well, you know, in our first year, we want to have 5% of the market and then the following year, 10 and growing it that way. You've got to make sure that your success is realistic, obviously, you know, point trying to get to Mars if you can only get to Venus, I suppose. And finally, it should be timely. So it should fit your here, your now and your near future. So I think if you manage all of that, you'll know what success looks like. And that fits the first part of your plan. This is what we need to do to be successful. Back to you, Matt. Thank you very much. So what I wanted to look at next is a um, business model, but uh, take a slightly broader view of it. Um, so what we typically find when we talk to clients in, in early days is that somebody has done some sort of a profit analysis. In that sort of simple exercise, I'm going to sell something for a thousand pounds, it's going to cost me those things in order to do it, I'm going to make a profit of 250 pounds. Very often what happens though is somebody says, well I can't do that exercise because I sell two or three things. Okay, well actually the simple answer is you use a blend. Okay, and if I, I see there's a couple of people around in the Western this afternoon, I, I did this at Jaguar for example, where um, you'd end up with something like 200 different possible models, and we'd end up with an average blended model. Uh, which is about as complicated as it can get with so many different models and so many different components, but it's entirely possible. I think the important bit though, if you're going to use a blended model, is to start to look at some of the sensitivities around it, because if the basket changes, the mix changes, well, that can make an important difference. I think the other interesting issue about, about that sort of analysis, in my example type three, there's a lot of profit, um, but in my example type one, there's not a lot of profit. The chances are actually the risks and the cash flows are different too. So what I would, what I would argue to somebody is that you may want to do a good amount of, um, of, of type threes, but the chances are you probably want to do a good amount of type ones and twos because the money comes in faster. They probably pay um, pay the rates and the rent and the um, and the wages this afternoon, whereas actually the jam, I'm going to make some metaphors, is um, is from is from type threes. So we see lots of businesses who focus to, sometimes too narrowly in a niche and focus on, on profit, but actually maximising their their commercial and their cash flow risks. Now, whilst that sort of exercise, that sort of profit mapping, is um, is very usual, what we no, what we do, don't tend to see is then somebody turn that into some sort of a single sale cash flow. All right. So if I look in my uh, in my little example, and it is a real example. So this this example is for somebody who was a um, boiler installation company, like uh, uh, plumbers, who used to go and fit boilers in, in people's houses. So the way they used to work was um, they would um, end up with buying a lead, a, a, a marketing a marketing lead, so they knew who the customer was going to be. Then they'd send somebody out in order to go and survey the uh, survey the property so they could make sure they do it. And then they would install the boiler and we'd have to pay some labor to do it. And then um, they'd have to wait whilst they issued some certificates and things whilst they uh, whilst they got paid but by the uh, by the customer and uh, they got probably got some credit uh, for the materials. The profit, the 250 pounds, is the same in both exercises. But it takes a long time to get there in terms of cash flow. So in my example of cash flow, it takes 13 weeks for that to unwind. And in order to make 250 pounds of the profit, at some point I've got to find 660 quid. And before I've actually sold anything, before I've actually done it. So actually that is quite a high friction, um, a high friction model. You know, that's going to take a lot of cash and it's going to be difficult to find the, uh, find the funding to do it because I couldn't use traditional factor, uh, methods like factoring, for example, where I've sold something and borrowing it in the invoice. 
So the, all I wanted to try and do is run you through the exercise that we ran with that business then, and then say, well, okay, what's, what can we change about this? What, what are the bits that are important to the customer? What are the bit, bits that are important to some of the other stakeholders? So we can stop borrowing 660 pounds in order to make 250. So actually the first thing we did was say, well, maybe we actually always make sure we get paid by credit card before we leave the client's premises. They see the boilers installed, they see it works. I can do the certificate there and then. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna pay some fees, but um, that now means I'm only borrowing 400 pounds, I'm not borrowing 660 pounds. So that's a big difference, that really helps. And then what if I take a step forward and then say, well look, um, what if I get an external surveying company to do the survey, and that means I can get credit on it. That helps. And then what if I take a bit of a step further and then say, well look, what if I do a deal with the marketing people and I pay them more, but the mate will wait for installation? Actually, that's a really interesting place to get to. Because now I've got a business that only makes cash, and can focus on operational excellence. It can focus on doing doing the job. It can make sure the right stuff is in the right place at the right time. The right engineers have visited the right um, the, the right um, the right customer. I can group my customers together because now I can choose where to put them. Suddenly, not only is this a, ca a, pro a cash generative model, but this makes the the problem of doing business a lot lot simpler. And this is a real answer. This is what we did. Um, so instead of spending half of their time worrying about the back office stuff of where that next panel is going to come, to, come from in order to, in order to um, fulfill that, that next client order, actually, we're just worrying about doing the client orders. And so really, product market fit. Okay, hello everybody back again. So uh, what we're thinking about here, that whenever I think of this, that phrase comes to mind from that movie, you know, build it and they will come. But that isn't necessarily true. Most people have a really clear idea of the product or service that they want to provide, but a less clear idea of what the market wants. So in order to be successful, you have to be prepared to let go of your assumptions. You need to be clear about the problem that you're trying to solve from the market's point of view, not from your point of view. That way you know what you're providing is what the market wants and is prepared to pay for. So it's not easy, but, it, but find ways to test, to adjust, to test again and to repeat. Sometimes the change you require may be large, but sometimes the change you require may be really small, it might be a tweak. You know, you can't force the square peg into a round hole, but you can turn a square peg into a round hole, as it were. So be prepared to always be changing. So when I was thinking about for the presentation, I was thinking of some examples, and one that came to mind was Vanish. I, I don't watch very much TV, but it does seem to me that every time I, I switch it on, they've got a new sort of ad for what Vanish will do. It's the air bubbly thing or it's a spray on or it's this always seems to be changing or, or whatever and the other thing that occurred to me is that volvo they did better in terms of selling their cars when they started to advertise the fact that to people's aspirations and how people would feel driving a car as opposed to telling how safely or how safe or emphasizing that part of the car for them so i think to nail the product market fit you should have in your head build it right and they will come and then you will be taking your business in the right direction. So Matt. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I want to have a look at sales and the science of sales, I guess, um, and the process of sales as, a, uh, as, as, a, as an important topic. Because most of the businesses we turn up, turn up and have a chat with, um, they think sales is magic. It's not. It's, it's effort. It's process. It's, it's understanding. It's learning about what works and doing it lots of times and improving it during that during that exercise and so i think where we where we started this is understand what the process is so often we meet clients who who say we have a four step four step process why because that's the way crm ships if you've got a three step process if you've got a 12 step process back it out be clear what it is but record, record your full opportunities within that, within that CRM. If you're a CRM-based business, if you're, a, um, if you're an online business and you're, you are, um, you're, you're, you're running transactions or something, then, hey, there will be a separate, a separate metric, there'll be a separate process, there'll be a separate funnel that you're worried about conversions and all the rest of it. You might be a, um, a, a physical-based business, a shop, for example. And, well, footfall becomes important. An average basket size, average order value becomes important. But... This is all data-led, this is all science-led, this is all, all process-led. So 
map out exactly what it is you're going to, you're going to do, what the important steps are in that. Define what the, uh, what the steps are. One of, one of the things that I've, I've always been interested in um, it, from an enterprise sales perspective is that we'll get through to, all the way through a, um, a long-term sales process. It might take a couple of months in order to sell something to an organization, but nobody can actually tell me what the client's name is at the end of it. Right, how was that? How did we find everything out about the client name? And it sort of, sort of asks the question, how often then, um, what are the defining characteristics of something at each stage? Have we asked whether there's a budget? Have we asked whether somebody else has got a veto on this, on this opportunity? Who else do we have to sell to? So mapping this stuff out is really, really important. Recording it is really, really, really important. But also keeping managing it actively. So sales is an incredibly hard work. Um, if, if a salesperson for their, for their job probably stands up every day, asks 10 people to, if they want to do something, and nine of, them nine of them tell them to get stuffed, salespeople are pretty resilient. They're pretty robust. They're pretty thick-skinned. So actually traveling in hope. Sometimes that some of their data, some of their expectations, some of the story they will tell you as their manager, as their business owner, will um, will will be slightly aspirational as well. So testing testing some of the things that they've said, challenging some of the things that they've said. Sometimes it is as simple as, hey, you're you're never going to win that, so just put it down. But actually, there's two or three over there that we could convert really quickly. Those those sorts of conversations are really really important. <laughs> Not to worry. So the next thing we wanted to, or a takeaway that we wanted you to have was how you bring finance into the core of your business. For a lot of people out there, and I'm sure for a lot of you, you're going to say that finance stops at processing and that's it. But finance, and we can give you so much more. So we can help you in terms of the analysis in your business, um, such as contracts, and that's both supplier and your own contracts. And as Matt showed in the earlier example, by aligning both, you can radically change the way that cash comes into your business. Large or small, so don't think because you're really small and you only see, you know, your, your accountant just do the financing, don't feel that that person doesn't have value for you, they do. So I thought I'd show this via an example. So consider the following, Not what often happens is that you will present your finance person with the contract after you've done the deal, you've done the negotiations and you're going forward now. And the first time they have any sight of what you're doing is at that moment in time. But consider the scenario where they were with, with you when you started the negotiation. So first of all, they looked at your costings and your margins to make sure that what you were proposing to offer the client actually made commercial sense for you. Um, they may have looked at the payment schedule with you and seen if they could bring in in some way earlier payment cycles or you know payments um, located to key events so that you could get the cash in as you were doing the work. Um, they may also have some in insight into the commercial aspects of the deal so that you're protected when it comes to warranties and stuff like that. So all in all, if you bring your finance in earlier into your business, they can aid you in making better decisions. And when I look back over my career, we had a scenario once with a client where they needed to renegotiate their prices mid-contract. And as all of you can appreciate, that's quite a radical thing to do. But I was able to sit down with them or we sat down together and we went through various scenarios and what it meant, what it meant in terms of pricing, profitability, cash flow, etc. So then when they went to do their negotiations, they were in a far better place to know what they could give, what they couldn't give, where they needed to hold the line and what they needed to, to explain. So with all of that in mind, what I would say is another takeaway is bring finance into the core of your business. It will aid your decision making and it will make you a lot stronger. Okay, so um, looking at data accuracy then, because frankly, the whole premise of a plan and trying to enact that plan and trying to uh, trying to run faster and run uh, run, run higher uh, because of, because of that plan relies on a common understanding and knowing where you are. Um, so often we find that uh, the clients have poor poor information full stop, whether it's financial information or other bits of information. It's obviously the junior people, often the junior people in an organization who end up doing the processing without an understanding, without a robustness um, uh, process to make sure it's gone into the right place. So we're worried about completeness. So often we find organizations who might be a bit strapped for cash, so they don't process all the invoices. Well, how does that help anybody? 
It doesn't, you, know, you should process the invoices so that you know where you are and all your information is complete. It might not mean you can pay them, but at least you've got all the information in one place and you, have, you can start to plan and you can start to build out a structure. Um, if, um, if you are trying to analyze your sales data, for example, making sure you have a complete data set is really important. It's, it's important that, um, that the information comes through in a timely fashion. You can have perfect information in six months, or you can have good enough information this afternoon. If you want to make a decision this afternoon, having it good enough this afternoon is a good place to be. And this is the point about different data sets apply at different times. So um, if you are a, I don't know, that's, let's say you're an online trading business, you'll have a view on, on your average, average basket size on transactions this afternoon. You might not have a view on profit until next month, for example, but hey, if you're trying to make decisions about what you do now or what your uh, what your lines and your offers are and what you want to clear out, different information means different things to different people. It's also such I mean, it's, it's a it's a fantastic um, environment to be in at the moment from a data perspective because so many joined up platforms, lots of open APIs, and um, we tend to use zero quite a bit in terms of accounting because hey, you can plug anything into it. Um, but that goes that goes for many uh, many data platforms. So if you want common understanding across the entire business, an SME can start to do that by using some clever tools. But one of the key issues is that if you are going to share data across the organization, you need to make sure it's quite consistent, it, um, it, everybody understands what the data means. So often we find that um, well, somebody will publish a piece of information, but, uh, but um, the recipient will have a different view on what it means because actually they don't have a common view of where the information came from, what the calculation was, or just having a playbook that says, we do this thing because, we calculate it that way because. Incredibly powerful, incredibly insightful, because instead of information coming out from, a, from, a, from somebody and then everybody jumping on to prove it's wrong, everybody jumps on it to work out what the next decision should be and how we can run faster and run higher. And, and that feeds nicely into um, using KPIs, your key performance indicators, and making sure that they work for you. So as you probably all know, um, your KPIs are indicators about ratios or statistics about your business. It might be about sales performance, gross margin, customer satisfaction, average basket side. It will be, again, specific to you and what you're doing. And the best ones for you to use are the ones that are driven either by your history as a business, your sector, or the strategy that you're pursuing. The only importance that KPIs really have, and I, I think this is important to stress, is that it's because they give you a way of measuring how well you're doing against the targets you've set yourself. And just because a KPI exists doesn't mean it's the right KPI for you. The only ones that are really going to be useful are the ones that help you understand your business. So it's worth when you're deciding the KPIs you're going to use to give some idea to timings. So as Matt mentioned earlier, if you're an online um, sales business, you'll probably have daily KPIs. But if you're a service business, it might be over a week or it might even be a bit longer term, say over a month. Um, so when you're choosing your KPIs, make sure you choose the ones that give you and help you to actually drive your business forward. And you don't need to have a lot, and that's really important as well. We go into some businesses, there's a massive dashboard, there's lots of things to look for, but if people were to sort of step away and say, well, what's the most important thing? They might not be able to pull that out. So as a business, decide what your top three are. And again, as I said, they'll be specific to you. They don't need to be what somebody else is doing. So gross, gross margin might be one, but for example, it may be customer churn, or it may even be customer repeatability of sales, so you get some idea of the effectiveness of your business. And remember that having a, and I think I've referred to it already, that having a KPI simply for the sake of it isn't, isn't useful. Um, if, you don't know, if you don't know what the KPI is meant to be doing for you, you can't use it right, your team can't use it right, or even worse, people will ignore it, which is even worse. So as a summary, I would say align your KPIs to your business needs, make them time relevant to what your business does, and only focus on the most important one. Five, three is even better, but focus on the most important ones for you. Thank you, Angela Marie. Now onto my favorite subject, cash. And mine too. Oh, uh, well, very, very good, thank you. Great. Sorry. That's um, <laughs> all right, no worries. And I think the most important point um, is that cash builds you, uh, gives you the opportunity to do stuff. 
it is a, a huge um, a huge enabler. It allows you to, to take time to, to decide. It, takes, it gives you time to make mistakes. It gives you time to improve. But frankly, few of us have got that luxury. So um, I guess the, the important bit for me, then how do you build the structure? How do you do stuff on a day-by-day -day -day basis that allows cash to settle down, to, to, to bring some calmness into, into, into cash planning? So actually, you can make some real choices. You can make some, um, some real choices about priorities, um, about some of the legal implications. You could go with, with what, you, what you have to pay. Um, it also brings some efficiency. So one of the things that we see quite often when we turn up is that an organization will pay somebody every day. We'll pay, no matter the same person, but there's an invoice being paid all the time. That's a hugely wasteful process because of course we log into the bank and we do all the authorizations and you send the right amount of money to somebody. And actually you can't see the big picture anyway. Because if you've got 30 invoices, that's perfectly clear, then if you do one every day to pay across a month, well, taking a step back and working out what you can afford to pay, what you have to achieve, what you might have to collect before you can pay, before you can pay everybody is really, really important. One of the things that we suggest to, um, in fact, we largely insist on when we, when we turn up with clients is that particularly overheads are paid once a month. That's not because we're being difficult, it's because we're being planned. And, 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 and the people who sell us those services, and whether that's rent or whether it's a consultants or service, whatever else, they get it, they understand, they know that they're going to get paid at the end of the month, it's just we're doing it in an efficient, calm, safe fashion. And one of the bits about calm and safe is, actually, we can bring some, some broader process to this where people are paying the right stuff. That uh, we've all heard of an extra invoice that's been added to a pack that, uh, that turns out uh, not to be a real one. Well, if you're running around panicking, paying invoices really nearly, that's easy to get, that's easy to happen. If, um, if you're running around at the end of the month in order, to, um, in order to try and collect some money in order to go and pay the wages, well, that's really hard work. Whereas if, if actually the, ca the cash flow and the payments were structured in a slightly different way, in a slightly different order, you'd probably protect the amount of money you need to pay the wages and you'd be running around to collect some money in order to pay the less urgent issues. The other thing that I think is, is really, really interesting is that we often meet clients who have some sort of plan, but in order to manage cash flows at the end of the month, they probably don't have a view as to what should have happened, and therefore they can't quite tell whether their, their plan is really going to the nth degree or is actually just a bit of a slip. And that's really important context. The other thing that people tend not to do is actually talk to the people involved. So if somebody owes you some money, ringing them up and saying, actually, you're putting them in real, in real dire straits by not paying me on time, is a real conversation that needs to happen. Speaking to that vendor, speaking to that consultant, speaking to that, um, to that landlord, and then saying, actually, I was waiting for a chunk of change, and it hasn't turned up. It's meant to be turning up. People are still tell telling me it's okay, but I can't pay you on the day I'm meant to pay you. Can we talk about it? That's a very helpful conversation. Waiting till they've blown up is an unhelpful conversation. So bring some structure to the process, some calmness to the process, which is a bit more organized and a bit more laid back. Actually have a structured plan that says this is what should happen, this is probably what's going to happen, and then have a real conversation. It's actually how to run cash on a, on a, on a sensible, proactive basis, on a constructive basis. Which sort of wraps up the eight points, but um, because of the, uh, the very broad um, nature of the businesses that, uh, that, that have attended today, We've not managed to be over, overly specific about that sort of business or this sort of business. I'm more than happy to explore some of those questions in, um, uh, in the question session. But we drive you to, the, to our website, mainly because it's a marvelous website, but actually it's really useful insight. There are some resources there. So, for example, I've just been talking about cash and how we would map out a plan for, for what should happen and what we can mitigate to actually what we can do. There's a template that does that. Dive on there, download it. Have a play with it. Ask some questions if you need to, um, because there are some real tools that um, that make that make life a lot better. There are also uh, some blogs there. So, for example, there's a, um, a a good blog on KPIs, which then goes into some some further examples and the calculation of those examples. Um, that I think that's that's useful as well. There's a, there's a bit of further insight to 
The kick goes on your belt. There, there is the bell to be rung. I can see Ben's agreed with us there about the difficult conversation on cash and you know it, it can be it doesn't need to be aggressive but sometimes just letting people know what you need and also giving them an opportunity to do their planning in, in regards to you if they're a bit cash strapped the conversation definitely needs to be had. And it's where the relationships are built realistically um, you know having those hard conversations and, and collaborating on the answer probably helps forge a stronger relationship overall. Now, yeah. all of us want to be people on time. We're not always in that position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have got an article on that as well with some practical tips on what you can do to manage your cash. So do have a look on our website at that article as well. Awesome. Thank you both very much indeed. Thanks, Alex. So i uh, got some questions that come in through the Ask a Question tab. Before we do that, um, those of you who haven't voted in the poll, just literally click that poll button um, to let us know, do you own your own business? Um, yes and no, or you're thinking of starting one. It's 70%, but yes. So we are speaking to an audience of, um, of business owners. A question that's, um, that's come in to you both is, uh, start, as a startup, what advice would you have regarding KPIs? What should I be focusing on right now? And I know that's going to, you know, it's pretty broad, but if you are a, you know, a startup business and you, you happen to have started up either during lockdown or just the other side and you've literally been hit with lockdown um, as your first business venture, uh, what kind of um, KPIs would you be focusing on? Any advice on around that? It, it, is there any broader context to the to the sort of business that person's in? No, we literally just got a short question that's coming. Right. Out. Yeah, I think that starts to make a difference. Um, so, if, if I was a product business, for example, if I, if I was a, let's, let's say I'm a, I'm a software business, it's very very easy to charge out of the box and then say, actually, I'm going for revenue, and that's my that's the thing that I'm looking for. Actually, probably not. That sort of business is probably looking for, to to test product product market fit is probably looking for users and KPIs around those users um, to prove that they've got something they could charge for at a later stage. So the number of users I'd, I'd, I'd acquire, um, what the process of the user acquisition is, because that's going to be scalable later, what the dwell time on a platform is, those could, that could be useful, useful KPI for, for that sort of business. Um, yeah. For a, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. So, for example, that's somebody, somebody who's um, who's selling a product, for example, um, who might be marketing, you know, shifting boxes. Then, um, probably we're looking for uh, for profit per box, profit per thing. Um, that might be linked at links, average order value. It may not. It depends whether you're doing the same thing each different time or lots of different things. And they're also looking for um, for for order order frequency as well. And, and I would add to that um, managing your short term cash flow, because I'm assuming mm. as a startup, you probably don't have a lot of cash in the bank right now. So, again, thinking through the process, having your initial assumptions and as we showed earlier, maybe breaking it down a bit and saying, well, what can I do to re reduce my reliance on getting cash in immediately or spending cash out immediately? And how can I make the two match? So I think I think those three things should probably uh, hopefully will be of help to you. I th you, you, you make a good point about cash flow management. I think this is where a um, a simple, in fact, there's a template on the on, the, on our website. The, yeah. the simple model is very very helpful. Right? It's very easy to, to to map out. You know, I'm going to pay such and such on such, something on such such a day. Things like tax make a huge difference. Each PAY makes a huge difference because you pay it the following month. Um, the VAT holidays that, um, that that came in um, during the during the start of the, of the crisis make a huge difference. Um, yeah. What sort of finance you end up with? Whether, whether you can get financing really really important. So um, there's a there's a there's a danger in being too simplistic. A slightly cleverer model gives massive insight, massive extra insight. But if, okay. if, if I go for the KPIs a bit, I think it's probably about transactions and proof. Yeah. And, and I mean, moving away from KPI just a little bit, but maybe looking for grants, seeing what mm. support you can get as a startup, because there is a lot out there. It's worth reaching out and spending just a little bit of time, because sometimes people want to rush into doing what they want to do. It's worth spending a little bit of time planning, getting a bit more information, seeing what supports out there before you maybe dive completely in. 
Yeah, and no, I think it's a good point to make. There has never been more help available if you're a startup than there ever has been in the history of uh, <laughs> the economy, I believe, especially off the back of this, uh, the packages that have been coming out over, over lockdown. But uh, sometimes there's, there's too much information out there, isn't there? Just trying yeah. to wade through that information. Um, I think okay, here's another. Sorry. No, so I think the scariest thing, and, and this, this seems to, um, to to resonate against with, with other startups. So my first startup was probably 30 years ago, actually. Um, the most scary thing about being a startup is starting. Yep. Started, actually, it's pretty straightforward. There's lots of help and support available. There's lots of advice available. Um, I think there's a danger in talking to too many sources of advice because then you end up um, answering to, uh, to advisors as opposed to doing your thing. So pick somebody you trust, pick somebody who understands what it is you're trying to achieve, listen to them, crack on and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here, here's, here's a question from Louise who says, um, <laughs> it's a tricky one to, to answer, I think, because um, clearly they're all important because you've listed out all eight. Um, and maybe I'm going to go for the for the reverse angle and go for cash. But interested to know what you both think. What would be the number one thing to do out of these eight things right now? I'm going to say cash. Yeah. <laughs> cash is the important one because it buys you time to sort everything else out, right? Yeah. If you've got a million pounds in the bank um, and you're spending 10 grand a month, you've got a lot of time to sort your stuff out. If you haven't got any cash in the bank, you don't have much time. So cash is really important. Getting the structure of that cash is really, really important. Um, once you've got the process of that stuff sorted out and once you've got the logic of that stuff sorted out and you're comfortable about how it works, Actually, that point quickly leads you into the eight other things, or the seven other things, rather, um, mm. because um, they're all important. Whether they're the same priority for everybody, it depends where you are. Yeah. So you know, if, if you're a startup, for example, and you've not yet got product, uh, product market proof, you're probably less interested in the sales process because actually getting users to do something is going to be really important. Whereas actually, if you've got product market, uh, fit, product market fit and you're comfortable with that, actually the sales process becomes more important. So there's balance in stuff. Yeah. Cash for um, the Other questions that's come through from um, Corey. Um, is there any any advice around sources of finance? Um, we're, we're currently looking to, to scale up um, our business overseas. Any, I mean, again, it's, as we say, we're de dealing with a broad, broad audience when it, when it comes to these questions rather than being specific. But... Um, you know, goalposts haven't changed. There's still the same amount of money out there. It's just trying to access that that kind of money. And, and where would your advice be around um, scaling up, kind of moving on to the next phase? I think, growth. <laughs> both want to jump in there. I think one route you could look down, and obviously you haven't given us any clue, is investors, the investment yep. route. Um, we've got an article on that. And I would say if that's something you're thinking about, it's really important to make sure you approach the right investors if that's something that could work for you. Um, Matt, any other ideas? Yeah, oh, I think really, isn't there? <laughs> there? There is, there is, you know, and I, and I think this 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 leads into what the, what the export is, what it is you're doing overseas, because you know if it's a if it's a non-fundable thing, then actually mm. invest in your own route. That's quite hard. But actually, you might have some, you might have an existing business that is able to access the funding on the UK stuff, and then um, that. That, that then allows you to expand overseas and, and, and run a bit faster. So it sort of depends where you are. If you're doing something at huge scale, and I mean really huge scale, then export guarantee um, uh, are available, but that's big. One of the interesting solutions I've seen, not just for product, but also for service, and I think this is really unusual. So there's an organization called Market Invoice um, who uh, do factoring. They mm -hmm. do factoring invoices overseas. Now, some of that stuff is a bit tougher at the moment because of the COVID yeah. stuff. It's less of an appetite for US dollar invoices. But, um, I mean, I've got a client, for example, who sells software as a service. There's lots of stuff in Australia. There's lots of stuff in America. No problem at all. They will they will factor their invoices through, through market invoice. That's a really good solution. Um, I don't see any other factoring company who will do foreign currency invoices. So that's, that's an interesting one that's worth having a look at. There's also, I suppose, depending on where you are in a country, you could look to see if there are local supports um, like the Development Bank of Wales. I can't remember off the top of my head the ones in the Midlands that we've worked with, Matt. That's just gone flying yeah. out of my head. 
comes in in the Midlands or then then leads into the North, uh, Northern Powerhouse. Yeah, but there are regional there are regional authorities that um, have you know cash that they're willing to give to support businesses to grow because they want to develop it in their local area. So that's another area where you can be looking for support. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, I was going to say regional, and I, you know, again, being from Cardiff, I'm seeing lots of my friends posting up uh, business owners' information on the particular package that, packages that are available in Wales that, that yeah. seem pretty generous, uh, I have to say. Yes, yeah. And I mean, even local authorities have support structures which they can do to start very small startups in their areas. So it, it depends on your size. I know you want to export, but it really will depend on your located, your size, and I suppose we need a bit more information really to tailor to tailor our answer. Yeah, and we've got your contact details, so we'll, we'll go back to that slide as well, um, maybe to, to post it. It's worth talking to um, to, to uh, the export organisations, um, the, the governmental export organisations, who can link you up in terms of sales trips, um, in terms of marketing trips. So one of the ones we did a few years ago, for example, was um, was hosted a, um, a client event in the ambassador's, ambassador's residence in New York. Well, actually, you wanted to go to that event as a customer. That's really interesting. You don't, you don't get invited to that. And all forced out by, uh, by, by, the, uh, by, by Trade Invest, all facilitated, facilitated by Trade Invest. So if you're trying to do stuff overseas, that sort of organization might not have a, a check to write you, but wow, great, great access and, and great leverage to help you do stuff. Yeah, and on, on that tip, I actually host a quarterly um, event for British American business, which is the US Chamber of Commerce in the UK. And um, they specialize in helping businesses who are looking to, to scale up in the US. You know, I've hosted meetings and we've got, you know, representatives from uh, different states in America who are clearly looking for people's business to go to places other than California and New York, New, New York you know, and everywhere, <laughs> everywhere in between the 40 plus states in between. So there is load, loads, um, loads out there. So um, question from Caroline. Um, let me just click on that tab, which is how often would you advise um, reviewing product market fits? Is that an annual thing? Is that more often than that? What would your advice be? Uh, I would say it's an evolving thing. You don't always need to do a big review, but you need to know if it's working. So again, if you've set yourself, if you've got a product at the moment and you set some criteria for it, you can measure it against that. And if you find it's working, then you're doing a good thing. I'd say do more of it. If you find it's drifting and you're not quite sure why, that might be an opportunity to look at it again and say, well, wh where are we not um, supplying the needs of the market? That's the advice that I would give. So it, it doesn't hurt, I don't think, every year. If you're, if you're the size of business where every year you're doing a budget, it probably doesn't hurt as part of that cycle to do it, mm. but you should have something in between as well, just to always make sure you're going in the right direction. It's very easy to drift, and that's where KPIs can help you as well. They 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 can be sometimes your sort of early indicator that there's an iceberg in the feet in in front of you, a bit like sonar and radar. So that's that's what I would advise. Um, what what do you guys think? Um, any indications that? that you've got at the moment with regards to do you think the the British summer is going to be business as usual or do you think people are downing tools uh, like I need a holiday um, you know and, and you know how many people have you know already taken holidays and business owners you know might have been looking at that strategically to try and you know get as many people as possible working on the business throughout the summer to kind of you know target the end of Q3, beginning of Q4, to finish the year strong. What What are your kind of thoughts on that? And I know none of us have got crystal balls, but <laughs> in any kind of, yeah, thoughts on that? Oh, I think it's going to be a mixture, really. It's going to depend on the industry that you're in. I think those people who have been hotels and small guest rooms and stuff like that, they're just going to gear up and yeah. go for it because people aren't going to go abroad. Well, there's not as much abroad, but mm. abroad's going to be, you know, people abroad are going to be doing the same thing. So I think a lot of people who traditionally have been perhaps seasonally summer is their big, they're going to, they're going to milk as much of it as they can. Um, they're going to go for it as hard as they can. And I think the rest of us are going to respond to that because yeah. who doesn't want some sort of relax and relax, relax and you know be able to just forget <laughs> in some way shape or form in the uh, next few months so i think i think what we'll find is that over the summer 
And maybe we'll just get more creative as well. You know, mm. how, how we relax over the summer, how we do things. I expect businesses, particularly those who may be in restaurants, take advantage of the better weather as much as they can. Um, who knows? But that, that's yeah. my sort of thinking for the summer. Mm. Matt, what do you reckon? So I think my advice is um, that it's an incredibly unusual, difficult, confusing time for most business owners. Taking a week off, hiding from it, thinking about it, synthesizing it, sleeping on it, coming back, challenging some of your ideas, doing it again. Um, I, I think a break is incredibly useful, useful exercise. This is an enforced tr strategic review. Mm. Um, Let's use it like that. You know, this is an, so there are businesses out there who have never been as strong, partly because they've been in a good place to capitalise on the opportunity, and partly because they've seen the opportunity as an opportunity. Yeah. So, um, hey, I accept that that's a bit blanket. There are some people who um, who, who will be, you know, you, you mentioned leisure a moment ago, Angela Marie. There's not a lot some people can do. They're passengers in this. And we've got some clients who have bit, been a bit passengers in this. But we've got some other clients who have turned around and said, right, okay, that's all past the track and we've got a chance. Now we're off the merry go round, let's do it. Um, mm. Great, let's do that. Yeah, no, no, I like that. It's interesting. I was chatting to um, CEO of a, an eight figure business down, down here in Poole that um, has a number of different businesses, you know, from property through to hospitality, wellness, et cetera. And he was saying um, that he was looking at it as a, you know, a blank sheet of paper to go just because we've done what we've done for the last 30 years doesn't make it right. If I had a blank sheet of paper now, what will I do for my marketing tomorrow? What will I do for my HR policy tomorrow? And I was like, do you know what? I love that idea and I'm going to implement it myself and advise everybody else to do something similar. Yeah, they're right. They're right. Yeah. You know, there are certain businesses where there's a greater imperative, there's a greater danger. So um, you know, there was an interesting piece on the BBC this morning about landlords, I think. Um, people have woken up, particularly where we are, where you don't have to travel to an office in order to do work. Mm -hmm. And then cultural shift about that many years we've got of time and effort and structure put into making sure we're still still working as teams and we're still happy and all of that stuff. But I'd be worried about if I was a landlord because something has to change in my traditional business. Yeah. This is an opportunity to be one of the leaders to go and do it um, as opposed to be done to. Yeah. It's an opportunity. Cheers. Uh, I, I think, was it Twitter, one of the first ones to actually put out there that everybody can, can work at home now? One of, the, one of those big kind of organisations, which is clearly suits them, I think, um, if you're paying the rent that they're paying in uh, on, the, on the west coast of the States. But, um, yeah, really, really good point. Um, coming up to the end now, uh, any last questions, throw them in. Maybe you want to drop back a slide to bring up your, your contact details and um, drop your – maybe into the um, – the, chat box as well struggling for my words there just that the people watching the replay will be the last uh thing that they see as well um or any linkedin profiles anything like that um thank you matt for posting that up there um and most common question to get asked guys is um when can you watch the replay so if you've enjoyed this um if you're watching this on social as well um because we are streaming live on three platforms um Please tell somebody about it. The replay is going to be up there um, forever. So if you found value from it, tell somebody else about it. Share the link with them uh, where they can register for this webinar. It will be in the feed as well for Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, and we're coming up to 150 webinars this Thursday as well. So there's a whole bunch in there for you to get, get value from. Uh, all the contact details for Practical CFO, um, courtesy of Matt and uh, Angela Marie are up there now. Um, so go to pcfo.co.uk if you want to help your own business to succeed. You've been talking to the right audience. Last check of the poll before I let you um, close out is gone up to 72.2%. Point two. Point two. <laughs> um, yeah, just closing words from both of you, me, me, just to, to close up here today. Um, and again, just to thank everybody from all over the country, I can see who've, uh, who've been watching here. So thank you all very much indeed for joining us today.
Yeah, thank you. And I hope you found it useful and you've got some tips and some takeaways there. And as you said, if you've got any other questions, do get in touch. I've um, posted my email on the chat because I'm not sure you can see them on our slide. I think they're covered by the pictures. So, <laughs> <laughs> do get in touch or go on our website and you'll be able to contact us as well. Awesome. I think that the, the, the takeaway for me is more about um, the things that we've outlined are small, simple, easy things to do, right? This doesn't have to be a complicated exercise. Any business is better to do them at any scale. So um, have a crack, have a go. Um, if it looks complicated, it, it, then, then something's probably going wrong, make it simpler. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is, these are really simple, practical, powerful steps in order to help the business move forward. So good luck. Okay, thank you. Awesome, um, thank you both very much indeed, pleasure. Um, thank you all for joining us. And now, literally, I'm going to hit end broadcast. Replay is going to be available in about 10 seconds for everybody uh, joining in on their lunch hour, etc. So thank you once again. Enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you for watching. Okay, bye-bye.